I'm here with Garrett Benny, founder and CEO, chief designer at Tax Outdoors. Thank you for participating in an episode of our series, Groundbreakers, Leaders of the New Economy. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. And I look forward to answering questions or uh, spouting off ideas I have. Who knows? It's great. So you create mobile human habitats, camper trailers, purposefully designed to inspire the journey towards and into nature. Can you talk to me about your career journey, the idea of taxa, and your current role? Yeah, I can talk for hours about that, but I don't want to scare you away. Um, yeah, what's well, good to know. I am trained as an architect and used to be an architect on the East Coast, but was, was lured to Houston to be a space architect and work for NASA on the insides of the space station and then consulting on lunar, lunar habitats for a while also. Um, so I became this odd expert on people in small spaces. And then the, uh, the founding idea for Texas was, was that background in education, um, but also I was living in Texas, which was a new environment for me that includes tarantulas and scorpions and more poisonous snakes than I was used to, even though I was a very outdoorsy sort growing up. Um, and I had small kids and I was looking around for a base camp to go camping in because also people may not know that Houston is a very uh, swampy, hot and humid spot. So mm -hmm. even, even if you are a serious outdoors person, you kind of want some extra accommodation for the, the hottest months, mm -hmm. what, what I call the uh, five or six months of August, which makes sense if you're, if you're from the East Coast anyway. Um, so, you know, I looked around at the RV industries, thought, okay, here I am an outdoorsy person and I want this base camp and it's like, oh, no, no one's making them. Like, what's, what's wrong with everyone? Uh, and at first I thought I would point out to uh, all these RV manufacturers that they were missing a whole demographic that included selfishly me. Um, and then even after I pointed that, that out to them, they didn't say, you are a genius. They said, uh, yeah, we're doing okay. Right. Um, and so I thought, well, God, I haven't really approached the world as an entrepreneur before, but here's this whole missing demographic of, uh, you know, the RV industry typified by, by white boxes on wheels is trying to make a house on wheels or a hotel room on wheels. And that is the wrong paradigm for a lot of people. It's obviously the right paradigm for a good number of people, or there wouldn't be so many, but, uh, I think it's misguided in a, in a business sense. I think it's, there's a whole lot of people who are former tent campers or who never wanted to sleep on the ground to start with, but just want a base camp from which to adventure. Um, and that has a lot of sort of Venn diagram overlap with an RV maybe, but uh, conceptually it's very different. And all of a sudden my space architectness and my earth-based architectness made a lot of sense. Nice. I'm curious how long the prototyping phase was or to get your first habitat. Oh, that's a very awkward question. Your question really is, did I beta test on my early customers? And the answer is yes. Uh -huh. um, you know, in a horrifying but now humorous way, the first six crickets we delivered, we, we literally forgot to attach the sink drain on them before we <laughs> mailed them out. Um, <laughs> and I think those first six, I don't know, the first 15 or 20, we, over the next few years, we took back because, um, you know, everything was founded, you know, I had an idea and I built it and I made it and I tested a few and broke them the way you're supposed to with prototypes. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know, that those first cricket run, uh, we ended up trading them, trading them out for better crickets in the end. Um, but I don't know, it takes a year and a half now, probably for from idea to a new habitat. Um, and, you know, once they're out there in the world, then we learn from our customers about what they, you know, we're, we're trying to address this whole realm of what is comfortable camping and what is a base camp. And that that's different for a lot of different people. Um, we make four different habitats and they are different sizes, but they're also different levels of defining what camping is, you know, when is it absolutely necessary that you have hot and cold running water? Right. When is it not? When do you need a furnace? Um, but, 
but we don't do things that RVs always do, which is sort of try to try to sell you a big flat screen TV. Right, when you're supposed to be out camping. I think that's truly groundbreaking. So when you look back at your life and your career, was there a t- turning point, something that made you reevaluate that's gotten you to where you are now or gotten the company to where it is now? Um, a million things, of course. No, I think, you know, my, my founding story is, it's sort of embarrassingly true. I really wanted something for myself, selfishly. The turning point was being in a new region and having small kids and thinking about the outdoor experience from a different vantage um, and thinking, you know, I used to be a wilderness backpacker. I'm not, or I'm not right now, or I, I can't be until my kids are a little bit older. So what, what is equipment now? Cause that's, that's how I approach the design of these things as equipment. Like they need to do the things that in a founding way I wanted to do, but now in a much larger community based way with our customers, you know, what is the range of adventures people want to have? Who wants to drive to Alaska and who wants to go out for a night planning at the last second? Um, and that's, that's very different than the RV industry. You know, over the past X years, you know, five, six years, overlanding has gotten really bigger. Other sort of approaches to this big, this big in-between is what I call it. I always design and think in terms of Venn diagrams. What is the sweet spot among all these different user groups? That is, you know, it's not a military adventure, but for some people it's an expedition and requires absolute sort of safety constraints. And some people it's the aspiration to drive further down a dirt road than they ever have before or than their friends do. Um, that's, that's, where, that's where Taxa lives, is right in this in-between. Um, because we're not just interested in people who've gone camping before um, or who used to be wilderness backpackers but have kids or a dog or whatever. We're, you know, the mission is to get people outside and there's a whole lot of people who don't get outside who, you know, in a mission philosophical, almost spiritual way, everyone should go outside because it's it's good for your soul. Even if you uh, go back inside and love it there, it gives you some appreciation of of the range of experience. Um, and so, I don't know, how do we not only make adventure equipment that you sleep in, but open up the the realm of adventure to, to people who've never done it before, to immigrants, to different socioeconomic folks, to cultures um, that have never, you know, camping's just not in their wheelhouse. and. Uh, and that means there's a barrier to entry that, that sometimes is just a, hey, you know, you may be worrying about how to do it right. There's no right way to do it, but here's some, here's some thoughts about how to get out there. It, it always cracks me up because some people, for instance, you know, grab the last pack of hot dogs from the last uh, gas station they drove past on their way to camp. And some people have spent two weeks planning the ultimate foodie experience in the wilderness. And yes. You know, those are equally fun. I like hanging out with both those people. So you you mentioned when I think of camping or this an adventure, I don't think of Texas, right? Yeah. I'm not necessarily thinking of Houston. I'm from Michigan, and so that was a big part of the culture there. I'm now in Portland, and uh, that's an even bigger part um, of why people are here and I'm taking advantage of the really the great outdoors. So did you start Taxa because you just happened to be living in Houston? Because there could have been a number of places where you could have launched the company. Oh, yeah, that's true. And sometimes I kick myself. But no, it's literally, and maybe I should have explained this. I moved to Houston to be a space architect because Houston and the piece of NASA that's there is where the astronauts are. So right. it's, a, it's very much concentrated on human spaceflight. And no, I simply had the idea here and mm-hmm. started. Um, and for a good long while, we didn't sell much product in Texas at all. Um, right. our, the lowest hanging fruit were the, the Rocky Mountains and the, you know, the Cascades, the two mountain chains west of us. But uh, at this point, we are nationwide and in Canada too, and have shipped some units overseas at various times. Um, but I'm, so I always want to answer a thousand questions at once. It's oh. very interesting to me how, how camping is different in different 
yep. states or yep. cities um, and what the culture is there and what what people expect, like what's in the air relative to what you do. And that for me in a like technical sense, that means different state parks, state park systems have different infrastructure that in Texas, almost all like really almost all state parks are expecting big RVs and it's hard to get a site without full hookups. Mm -hmm. Whereas in uh, states with a lot of national parks or many state parks or uh, you know BLM lands, you just can go out there and camp. You can boondock off the grid. I never even thought about that, but you're right. Um, and that's why, you know, that's our products are all about camping. It's like, yeah, we we thought about this. You can drive one mile down a dirt road or a hundred miles down a dirt road and you don't even have to think about solar power until you're four or five days into it with, you know, running a refrigerator and a furnace and a this and that. So it's really, you know, and hunting is a different culture in Texas than it is in Michigan or where I grew up in Maine. Um, all these outdoor activities are different and that's, you know, the U.S. is beautiful and big and diverse, but in a in a sense, it's kind of there's, you know, there's mountain and desert and ocean and river and, you know, a few basic sort of elemental sort of sites um, that come along with a different groups of activities, too. So tell me how the business fared during the pandemic. I would think those that already had habitats um, saw that as an advantage, right, to spend time with their families or, again, to spend time outdoors. But did you see it increase in sales? How did that impact? Again, oh yeah, we were very, uh -huh. we, I mean, we were wildly lucky to be in a, a pandemic yeah. happy business. Um, yeah. You know, obviously I have a lot of friends who were not, who whatever, lost their restaurants or lost right. this or didn't go downtown for two years. Um, no, people in the camping business had to struggle to keep up. Um, and, you know, therefore we have lots of complaints or wisdom, I should say, about supply chain uh, and things like that. But, you know, we, we grew tremendously um, because people who had habitats were using them. People who didn't have habitats wanted them yesterday. People yeah. who couldn't get them yesterday were willing to wait six months. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, again, all the outdoor industry from clothing to large scale habitats we're very lucky. And uh, I think it's really fascinating to me how that has changed business too. You know, a lot of companies realized they could get uh, more directly to their consumer. And the, the issue wasn't what store could we be in, but how do we expose, expose our customer to our product? Um, and that's led to really cool opportunities with collaborations with other complementary brands. It's not like I have one shirt among the 40 shirts at an REI, it's like, hey, how can we go camping together and yeah. expose more people in our, our crowd to your crowd and your crowd to our crowd? And it's really fun to find companies with uh, similar missions that also complement each other to do a product collaboration with, to do a photo shoot with, to have a, a camp camping weekend with. Um, yeah, so, so I that, think that was going to be my next question. Did some of those partnerships come out of the pandemic or how has the company evolved as a result of the pandemic? Again, we were talking about pivots. Do you, are, there, are there any distinct moments that you can think of? Well, yes. So have we pivoted? Even, even before the pandemic hit, you know, Taxa, you know, legally we sell three of our four products are RVs and that puts us in a, a vehicle category that's controlled by the Department of Motor Vehicles of different states. Um, but always, you know, again, our customers are generally not RV customers in their minds. They're buying adventure equipment that they sleep in. And that means going to an RV dealership is often a, a bummer for them. That's not what they imagine. Um, you know, there are great RV dealers and there are less great ones, just like auto dealerships, et cetera. But, um, but that's not where our customer is. Our customer is thinking, I have this idea of an adventure I wanna do with myself or my friends or my family, how do I do it? So even heading into the pandemic, we were making much greater efforts to uh, talk to our customer in all sorts of different ways and meet them 
where they are, which means on their phone or their laptop or right. in their head and yeah. not require them to go to an RV show or an RV dealer. So we were concentrating on our website and getting people in house here who could field telephone calls and say, you know, hey, you've done this a thousand times, but you want to go to Alaska or hey, you've never done this and you want to, but you've never towed a trailer before. You know, we have coaches, we call them habitat specialists, but um, nice. okay. how do we how do we hold your hand? How do we remove a barrier? How do yeah. we talk to you about, you know, anything? But uh, again, philosophically, we want you to get outside. We may find you're a house on wheels person who say, you know, the more you're talking, the more you are not us, but go talk to those people. Yeah. But mostly people get it because, because we have a good website and we have a lot of images out there uh, very often a uh, customer generated showing it's like, hey, here I am with a family of four. Here I am all alone. Here I am at a big campground. Here I am doing stuff I've never done before and laughing about it. You know, yeah. here's here's the food I dropped on the campfire by accident. Here's the 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 best night ever I had watching stars with friends. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that's what's really cool about a, a growing company and you know, with our growth during the pandemic, our community gets bigger and that, you know, bigger is better in a lot of ways. But for me, bigger, you know, I'm a designer. It's like, oh my God, all these new people are yeah. using these things in ways, you know, we thought of a lot of stuff, but you all are thinking of more stuff. How can we react to that and improve our product? What kind of stories can we tell through our social media, et cetera, that, that help us transmit our mission and help remove a barrier for you. And the barriers can be really small. I, I jokingly said about the founding of the company, you know, tarantulas and scorpions and poisonous snakes were a barrier to me. And I spent all right. my youth growing up outside. They just scary to me too. <laughs> we don't have those things in New England. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's like, do, can I bring my dog? Where does a tarantula live in, in the tree or in the campfire? And I know it's the campfire because as my wife and I were discussing that, we lit our campfire and like six tarantulas oh. ran out. This is like the first month we lived in Texas, um, oh. ran out of the stones around the campfire and, and we went to bed at six o'clock that night. It's like, let's go to bed. We're not very hungry. <laughs> let's let's get inside yeah. and make sure a tarantula doesn't follow us. Um, and you know, that's silly. Now tarantulas are so cool to find out in the wild. You know, I haven't For been some. by one, but it's like, it's, a, you know, here I am in this new place. Yeah. But, um, so I, I don't know. And, you know, I'm fascinated. Again, I grew up totally outdoors and the summer camp and wilderness camping and cooking. But all these people didn't. You met Divya, my president, like she never went camping and still she fell into Texas. And now it's, you know, with her kids at her at their ages, you know, being outside is fantastic, yeah. eye-opening. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is. So you said the company's growing. What oh, yeah. do you expect from Taxa in the future that you can share? Uh, that's a good additive. Um, <laughs> well, there are more habitats coming down the pike. Uh, our expertise right now is habitats, but our, our mission is getting people outside. So what our products, I mean, I sorry, our our philosophical, our nonprofit and our for-profit mission is all to get out, get people outside. So, you know, we're doing collaborations with other brands to expose more things. We're coming out with new habitats and there will be other products in the future. Um, but we're also reaching into communities that haven't had the, the luck or the fortune or the ability to get outside and trying to remove those sorts of barriers. Um, which, you know, that with with some scale comes the ability to uh, to reach out and teach and demonstrate and welcome with all, you know, all the, the difficult, embracing the difficultness of all that, if that makes sense, you know. Um, so that's really beautiful to me. I was raised in a sort of non-profity household. So I've always wanted, it's like, when do we get to a point where we, yeah. are giving back and teaching and demonstrating and uh, creating, I don't know, 
making the outdoors as much of a, a great melting pot as the US is, as Houston demonstrably is. Houston's a really exciting city in all those ways of uh, being big and vibrant and diverse. And, you know, if I spun my computer around, you'd see that on our office. You'd certainly see that on our factory floor. I think we have 26 or 28 country flags hanging in our factory. Nice. Representing. Oh, very nice. Um, and that's, I don't, you know, that's beautiful to me. That's um, got to be satisfying, right, as a founder. Yeah, it, how did- As a true groundbreaker, yeah. How do all these ideas you have, you know, ideas are easy, making them real is really, really hard. Um, and, you know, your questions about pivoting or innovating, I of course like to think we'll never stop that. Um, but I also don't, you know, change change is the is the natural state if that makes i mean i think that makes the most sense so if we're not changing and evolving and aggressively interested in designing for tomorrow or five years from now um then then we're not doing much we're just making a product um and we want to make better mouse traps not just in a product way but in a way that that are very thoughtful about all the all the systems at work in the world, you know, environmental and political and social and economic and but camping and state parks infrastructure and how you how you get a great meal outside all those things mixed together and uh, in that Venn diagram way I keep referencing in my head, you know, there are lots of sweet spots and there's lots of change afoot relative to technology on the outside. And how companies are, you know, innovating and where you're allowed to camp, how private land becomes available to camp on, how remote working is a pandemic thing, how many definitions of that are there. Um, you know, it, it's exciting, I think, about EVs a lot and even more slightly science fiction-y, but not, not even, our autonomous vehicles. Right. Um, are all of a sudden not, not vehicles at all, they're just autonomous spaces. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that gets at my architecture background and how to think about that. And all of a sudden commuting doesn't exist. And um, yeah. that means people are outside and, and, you know, I don't know, I go, I go crazy and get inspired and excited. Uh, so you're, so you're inspired, you're excited. Who are disruptors that you admire? You know, you fed me that question before and I, I draw a big blank. I think really? I thought of, of Bucky Fuller. Do you know Bucky Fuller, Buckminster uh -huh. Fuller? He's long dead, but uh, he created the, uh, oh my God, I'm spacing his most famous creation. He was an engineer, but for me, he did two things that I've, I've always been thoughtful about. He wrote a book, I think in the mid sixties called Spaceship Earth, which again was sort of at the beginning of the space era and it's it basically was pointing out it's like hey the earth is a, a closed environment like we cannot afford to be thoughtless about how we're treating it okay. and that's you know become much more true and when i work at nasa it's like oh the space station is very much a closed environment you know the people there know how much hair falls off your body every day and how many skin cells because that's a trash problem and uh, of course that's true on earth too all these things that we do um so it was great to come back and design, you know, start my company and think, oh, like this is this is a system and we can improve the system here and there. And in one of Fuller's other innovative ideas in my head, um, and it's actually on his gravestone, is uh, do you know what a trim tab is? Or should okay. I tell you what a trim tab is? His his gravestone says, call me trim tab, but a trim tab if you imagine like an, a giant boat, an oil tanker and the rudder on that and how slow it, it is to steer a giant ship. Uh -huh. A trim tab is like a little teeny rudder on that rudder and it uh -huh. creates a little disturbance in the water uh -huh. that makes it like a thousand times easier to turn the big steering wheel. And so that's, that's both a very literal sort of engineering fact, but in, as a, a metaphor, it's like, what small difference can an individual or a company make that makes a really big difference in society or the environment? So if taxa can be a trim tab, I love that. That that lets 
a lot of people go outside, you know, comfortably and safely and productively in a way that's not deleterious to the environment. You know, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's my dream. Um, it's really hard. And I don't think you know that you're doing it. You just, you lean on individual examples. When, when I talk to a family or a person who's never gone camping before, who's camped a lot and, you know, was able to start teaching their kid something about it because of something we made, you know, that's, that's a trim tab happiness in my soul. But can we do that just not just can we do that in the world? Can a company do that? And yes, there's a million examples. Um, and, you know, I always want to make it complicated. I don't, you know, I want to change the world more than I want to make money. So ob obviously, I hope one wants to change the world for the better always. So, uh, so how do we do that? <laughs> well, what a great way to end being a trim tab. I want to be that as well. I'm going to look more into that. And Garrett, I really appreciate you joining me today and sharing about taxa um, and just in your journey and really being, I think, a disruptor and groundbreaker um, in our region. I can't wait to share this video with those in our region so they can learn more about taxa if they didn't get to meet you a few weeks ago. And um, I wish you the best of luck. All right. Thank you so much.